Hallelujah. Let's do it under the Lord with all of our hearts and lift our voices and triumph. Thank you, Jesus. You may be seated. The villain of 1 Samuel 11, Nahash the Ammonite, put a price on the lives of the men of Jabesh Gilead. He was a slithering, slimy creature. His very name means serpent. He agreed to leave them alive if they would allow him to thrust out their right eyes. Conflict was not just a possibility, but war was a way of life. With shield in the left hand, with sword or spear in the right hand, a warrior without a right eye was powerless to see either his peril or his potential. It was a cunning and dastardly deception that Nahash wrought against Jabesh, the serpent with whom we war tonight would be happy if we would take those same terms. He will concede to us our right to exist if we will agree to be blinded to our adversary and to our opportunities. But amidst the backdrop of thundering judgments directed toward Israel in the prophecy of Zephaniah, there's a litany of promises concerning that august day when Christ's kingdom is going to come. And those promises are vicariously ours because the scripture says we have tasted of the powers of the world to come. They are ours to enjoy now. They are God's intent for the end time. And these are some of them. First of all, he said the Lord Thy God in the midst of thee is mighty. He was with Eden in Adam. He was walking with Enoch at the beginning. He sojourned with Abraham. He met Jabok or Jacob at the brook Jabok. He burned in a bush for Moses in Midian's desert. The covering of badger skin didn't bother him. Jacob Jehovah became a pilgrim and dwelt amidst the cashmere and gold of Israel's wilderness tabernacle. When the staves were pulled out of the burglarized Ark of the Covenant and it came to rest in Solomon's temple, a cloud of glory filled the house because God had come to dwell in the midst of of his people. Hallelujah. Zerubbabel's attempt to replicate it was a poor one. And the old men wept when they saw it. But heaven thundered and said, The glory of this latter house shall be greater than the glory of the former house. Hallelujah. After four centuries of silence, God made himself a tabernacle. For God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself. He said, it is expedient that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter cannot come. And I will pray the Father, and he will give you another Comforter. Here it is, that he may abide with you forever. The Lord thy my God in the midst of thee is mighty. And in the second chapter of Acts, he moved in to that apostolic church. And so far as I can tell, he hadn't left yet. Our worthy adversary will try to fix our focus on the faults of Christ's church. He'll try to convince us that he has abandoned his body. Perish the fault. Just read your Bible. Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, Laodicea. The very mention of their names reminds us of the plethora of problems that plagued those seven churches of Asia. But when John was on the Isle of Patmos, he said, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. I heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet saying, I am Alpha 
and omega, the first and the last. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me. And being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. Hear me now. Revelations 1 and 20 says, At those seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven fraught with failure churches of Asia. And what did John see in the midst of those seven candlesticks? One, like another son of man, clothed with a garment down to the foot and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. His head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow. His eyes was a flame of fire. Hallelujah. The Lord is in the midst of his church. Hallelujah. Sit down. His feet were like in the fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace. His voice was as a sound of many waters. He had in his right hand seven stars. Hallelujah. Out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, and he laid his right hand upon me and spake unto me, saying, Fear not, for I am the first. I am the last. I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. It sounds like the one I'm looking for. I found him. He's in the midst of his church. But he's not just in the midst of his church. The Lord thy God in the midst of thee is mighty. Ah. He said he was El, the Almighty One, full of strength. He said he was Elohim, the One of majesty and greatness. He was Yahweh, self-existing. Adonai, the ruler and master. El El Yon, the God most high. El Rohai, the God that sees. Hallelujah. El Olam, the God everlasting. And in Exodus, he said, I am Ahaya, Asher, Ahaya. I am that I am. Zechariah 14 and 9 said, In that day there shall be one Lord. And His name, I said His name shall be one. So now where two or three are gathered together in His name, He said, I will be in the midst of them with all of His glory and with all of His might. Thomas said, the heavens declare his glory. If we never opened our mouth tonight, he'd still get some praise. We're standing on a whirling ball that's got a diameter of 8,000 miles. But he put one up above us and called it the sun, and it's got a diameter of 864,000 miles. Closest star is 26 trillion 
miles away. That's the near one. The farthest star is 59 sextrillion miles away. If a sheet of paper represented the distance from the earth to the sun, 93 million miles, one sheet of paper, the edge of the universe would be a stack of paper 31 million miles high. Ain't he something? With the Halley reflector on the top of Mount Palomar, scientists had discovered that just in the bowl of the Big Dipper, there are perhaps a million more galaxies as great as our own. Here's what David said. The heavens are the work of thy hands. Even they will perish, but thou dost endure. Ha ha. Hallelujah. He said all of them will wear out like a garment, like clothing. Thou wilt change them, and they will be changed. But thou art forever the same, and thy years will not come to an end. The Lord thy God in the midst of thee is mighty. The earth showeth his handiwork. He adorned it. He hollowed out the seas. He reared up the mountains. He loaded the mines. He covered the earth with a cataract of color. Indeed, David said, the earth is the Lord's. And the fullness thereof. And the world. And they that dwell therein. For he hath founded it upon the seas. He hath established it upon the floods. Who shall ascend unto the hill of the Lord? Who shall stand in his holy place? He that hath clean hands. And a pure heart, who hath not lifted up his soul to vanity, nor sworn deceitfully, he shall receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. This is the generation of them that seek him, that seek thy face, O Jacob. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be lifted up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Here it is. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty. The Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O ye gates. Even be ye lift up, ye everlasting doors. And the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. Before there was a mountain or a man, before there was galaxies or grass, there was God. <laughs> he was mighty. They put Daniel in a den of lions and they sealed the door so he couldn't get in. But he got in and locked their jaws because you can't lock him out. They put him in a tomb and they sealed the door so he couldn't get out. But on the third day he rose triumphant because you can't lock him in. He's in our midst. He was Adam's creator. He's promised seed. Abel's testifier. Enoch's companion. Noah's true and living ark. And he's in our midst tonight. Uh -huh. He was Abraham's El Shaddai, Isaac's substitute, Jacob's wrestler, Joseph's shepherd, and stone of Israel. And he's sitting where you are tonight. Moses' great prophet, whom the Lord would raise up. Aaron's rod that budded. Deborah's song. Samson's strength. David's slingshot. Solomon's wisdom. He was all of those. And he is here in our midst tonight. Yes, he is. He was Elijah's mantle, Elisha's double portion, Isaiah's righteous servant, Jeremiah's righteous branch, 
Ezekiel's man of fire, Daniel's ancient of days. And he's in our midst. Joel's restore the wasted years. Hosea's ever faithful husband. And Malachi, he's the day spring from on high and the day star in my heart. He is Matthew's Messiah. He's Mark's miracle worker. He's Luke's son of God. He's John's son of God. He is Nathaniel's king of Israel. He is Philip's Lord and God of me. He is Peter's rock with the keys to the kingdom. He's Paul's potter with the power over the clay. He's Jude's only wise God, our Savior. He he is all of that and infinitely more. And He is in our midst tonight. And He is mighty. The Lord thy God's in your midst. He's mighty. And He will save. Zephaniah 3.16. I didn't make it up. He really does. By angelic annunciation, she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall his people from their sins. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be. For the Son of Man is come to seek and to and whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be Amen. say not ye there yet four months and then come at the harvest behold I say unto you lift up your eyes and look on the fields for they are white already to harvest this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners it's God's intent for the end time. He is in our midst. He is mighty. He will save. Somebody shout yes. yes. Be glad then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God. For he hath given you the form of rain moderately, and he shall cause to come down for you the rain the former rain and the latter rain in the first month and I'll restore to you the years that the locusts have eaten and the canker worm and the caterpillar and the palmer worm and it shall come to pass afterward saith the Lord I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh your sons and your daughters shall prophesy your old men shall dream dreams your young men shall see visions and upon my servants and my handmaids will I pour out in those days of my spirit say it say he will save say he will save say he will save that's God's intent for the end time to those of you who think revival is riding off to the end of the sunset. Perish the thought. When the proponents of a powerless and paralyzed God have had their voices silenced in death and the worms have made motels out of their eye sockets, there'll still be salvation in the name of Jesus Christ. Neither is there salvation in any other for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Unto us is born this day in the city of David a Savior. He will save. He will save. You just had a revival. He will save. He will rejoice over thee 
with joy. I'm still in the book. God's intent for the end time. Sometimes we look at ourselves with such jaundiced eyes. We can't imagine that God would ever find anything in us to rejoice over. We're going to heal you of that this week. In the name of Jesus. And heal me of it. The prophet said that God sits on the circle of the earth. What a depressing view. He's daily forced to face the wicked aberrations of this world gone awry. He sees everything. The wooden stands of an English soccer stadium become a raging inferno for 3,000 fans and a TV audience of millions watched them burn and God saw that. We lament the holocaust of millions of Jews and yet we abide a generation characterized by genocides of its own. Herod and Hitler with their systematic slaughter of the innocents are mere pikers when you compare them to the legalized murder of one and a half million defenseless infants in this country every year. <laughs> Through the media, we're fed a daily diet of disease, dismemberment, and death. Rock stars attack hooded women on concert stages with saw blades, while thousands of oddly bedecked blue and orange-haired teenagers scream their adulation. Homosexuals claim they have 50,000 members in their church at a homosexual convention in Dallas, Texas for the Metropolitan Community Church. The delegates were encouraged to be filled with the Holy Ghost and enjoy your homosexuality. God sees it. This government under God gave $380,000 to resettle homosexual Cuban refugees in this country. Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh, nice, that's one of our latest exports to India, declared from one of his meditation centers, he said, knowing your sexuality, one day you will discover your spirituality and then you will become free. Have I got news for him? You want to be free? You shall know the truth. The truth shall make you free. He whom the Son has set free is free indeed. Life has become the theater of the absurd where the most bizarre incidents garner only a passing notice and are quickly replaced by a newer, more current atrocity, outrage, and obscenity. And imagine with me that God has a panoramic view of the despicable state of the crown of His creation. He is forced daily, say daily, to look at the deplorable plight of man and the earth. Ours is a generation with the same crowd that marches to save the baby seals, demonstrates for the right to abort their own babies. A world where the womb is the most dangerous place and a schoolhouse runs a close second. One in three homes in America is victimized by crime. Eighteen of every 100 parents are assaulted by their kids. One in every seven children are abused every year. That translates to six and a half million annually. By 1990, there'll be more people die by AIDS than in automobiles. No wonder the Bible said that God will rejoice over us with joy. You got the picture now of the world you're living in? And the eyes of the Lord start running to and fro throughout the earth, seeking someone whose heart is right toward Him, that He might show Himself powerful in their behalf. He's been looking at all that garbage. 
He's been looking at all that garbage. He's been digesting all that garbage. And all of a sudden, his focus is fixed on Alexandria. He sees uplifted hands. He hears voices shouting his eternal praises. He hears the music intoning the wonder of his glory. He sees us dancing. He hears us clap our hands. Jesus, and he can't contain himself. He rejoices over us with joy. Let's clap our hands under Jesus. all that mess and he's looking all of a sudden his eyes go and he sees the consequence of the cross not creation ruined creation redeemed and he can't hold still <laughs> You thought you got happy when you came in this place tonight. You should have seen Jesus. Bible said the angels in heaven rejoice over a sinner that repents. I've got news for you. Their behavior is not abnormal. Scripture says he ascended into heaven and sat down on the right hand of power. But when they were stoning Stephen, he said, I saw him standing up. There's some things that will bring God off his chair. And his church is one of them. <laughs> Woo! We come in this place and begin to exalt his greatness. And God rejoices over his church with joy. said when the shepherd finds the lost sheep, he puts us on his shoulder and goes on his way rejoicing. The reason you can't hold still, you're taking a joy ride on the shoulder of our Savior. God's intent. Next, next line says, He will rest in His love. God's not having an anxiety attack. He's not fitful. He's not fretful. He's not frustrated. He's cool as a cucumber. Paul said, The love of Christ constraineth us. People properly. Figured out our options. He looked at Jesus and said, To whom can we go? Thou, Lord, hast the words of eternal life. He ain't worried about losing me. He rests in his love. Who shall separate us from the love of God? Shall tribulation? Shall distress? Shall persecution? Famine? Nakedness? Peril? Sword? 
Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Somebody shout amen. He said, I will gather them that are sorrowful for the solemn assembly to whom the reproach of it was a burden. Stay with me quickly now. Everybody here weeps for the people who fail. October 19th, 1812, Napoleon's army began its retreat from Moscow. He had 150,000 men, 50,000 horses, 600 pieces of artillery, 40,000 stragglers. They departed with the sun shining. It was a bright day. But quickly, something more wrathful than the Cossacks assaulted their flanks. It was an army of Arctic blasts with icicles for bayonets and hailstones for gunshot, co commanded by the voice of the tempest. It was an army, a blizzard battalion that attacked them. And at night, the soldiers would get in a circle to try to huddle and stay warm. But in the morning, they did not get up because they were dead. The ravens would come and eat their morning meal of corpse. They left a trail strewn behind them with the rich treasure that they had looted from the Russian capital and in a matter of days nearly 100,000 people were hurled by an invisible hand into the snowbanks and died. Not a lot unlike the scourge of our own age where because iniquity is abounding many people are overtaken by the blight of cold heartedness and fall by the way. But the Bible said, in the end time, I will gather them God is going to drop a dragnet of redemption and He's going to reclaim the people that we have lost. Listen, the army of Philistia was arrayed against Israel. Saul was far from the fray under a pomegranate tree in Gibeah. His son Jonathan stuck his staff in the honey. His eyes were opened. He turned to his armor bearer and he said, Look, let's go and fight the Philistines. It matters not to God to save by many or to save by few. Say yes. His armor bearer said, Do whatsoever is in your heart. I'm with you. We could use a little more of that. You can't overdose on encouragement. I'll take some affirmation every now and then. Jonathan said, let's creep through the crevice here. Show ourselves to them. And if they say stay where you are, we will. But if they say come to us, we'll know the Lord has given them into our hand. They crawled through the crevice. Said, yo! Philistines looked up and saw just two men standing there. <laughs> they said, come on down. We'll show you a thing or two. Johnson said, come on, pal. The Lord hath given them into the hand of Israel. And the Bible said they marched on them and they fell before Jonathan and his armor bearer slew them. And there was a great trembling in the host of the field because Israel was on the move. Somebody had found their faith. They had broken through. And God had given them the victory. And what was the result? The Bible said that the Israelites who had gone over to the Philistines and the Israelites who were hiding in Mount Ephraim when they saw the victory that was in Israel, they came home to Israel and said, We want to march with you again, buddy. Huh? I 
see it in my church. Revival, evangelism, power, signs, wonders, miracles. And now the backsliders are feeling the pull of a powerful church. And they're saying, wait a minute. We want to come home and enjoy Jesus and run the race of the redeemed. I said, God is going to restore the backsliders. It's His intent for the end time. Your mother, your father, your sister, your brother, your friend, your uncle, your aunt, your workmate, they're coming home. They're coming home. They're coming back. They're coming back. They're coming back. There's an army of fallen apostolics that are coming back. Shout yes. Shout yes. Finally, he said, I will undo. Isn't that a neat word? I will undo all them that afflict thee. Brother Urshan, you said it last night. I want to be there to see it. <laughs> the Bible said, when the enemy shall come in like a flood. He didn't say if. He said, when? His assault is a certainty. Woe to the inhabitants of earth and of the sea. For the devil has come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. Debilitating diseases. Dilemmas that defy solution. Unprecedented domestic difficulties. Demonic oppressions. Let's be honest about it. The prince of the air is flexing his muscles. His assault may be a certainty, but I'm here to tell you defeat is his destiny. God's going to undo him. <laughs> David said... They imagined evil against thee. They imagined a mischievous device, but they were not able to perform it. Take heart, for this cause was the Son of God manifest that he might destroy or undo the works of the devil. God's intent for the end time. He's going to undo the devil. Somebody said amen. amen. Haman had the king's ear, but he had a rogue's heart. He hated Mordecai. He was a menace to him. He was willing to wipe out the whole nation of Israel to get him. So he took his plan to purge his peculiar people to the king. And the king listened and put his seal on it. The post hastened out throughout the provinces. And Haman hurried home and built a gallows. Esther threw a party and invited the king and Haman. King was tickled to death to get all that attention lavished on him, and Haman was pleased as punch to be on the guest list. It went over good, and so Esther said, Let's do it again tomorrow night. They said, We will. She said, I will, and they did. <clears throat> but in the meantime, God sprung into action. He'll only take so much. You may have come here under it, but friend, you're going to get a deliverance while you're here that's going to roll your socks down. I said, you're going to get a deliverance and a roll your socks down. God is going to undo them that afflict us.
Haman ran home, started boasting. His promotion, talking about his clout, his wealth, and his favor. King got insomnia and called for the Chronicles to be read to him, and God picked the page. And they read to him that some cat by the name of Mordecai that sat at the gate saved his life. Ha! So he started trying to find a way to reward him. Well, Haman was home carrying on with his wife Zeresh and their friends and his cup of self-aggrandizement ran over and he decided to go get permission to hang Mordecai early. So he came walking into the outer court and the king was scratching his head trying to figure out a way to honor Mordecai. He's going to undo them that afflict us. It's his intent for the end time. <laughs> Brother Urshan, I want to be there to see it. He said, I'm going to get thee praise in every land where thou hast been put to shame. King said, who's there? They said, it's Haman. He said, come in, Haman. And he did. And the king said to Haman, he said, what do you think should be done to the man in whom the king delighted? Haman, resourceful man that he was started searching his mind. He said, I'll tell you, I think that the royal apparel should be put on him. I think we ought to put him on the king's horse. A crown. He needs a crown. Yes, he said, get the crown and put on his head. And then get one of your trusted princes to lead that man through the city shouting thus doth the king do to the one in whom he delights the king said that's it I like it Haman started pulling off his coat. The king said, go get my robe, go get my crown, go get my horse, and put it on Mordecai, who is at my gate, and you lead him through the city, and shout, thus did the king do to the one in whom he delights. God's going to undo them that afflict us. Let's stand. Come on, let's clap our hands. He's going to undo the one that afflicts you. king of Assyria may have come to Dothan to take Elisha into captivity but act four of that play Elisha's got the reins of the king's horse and he led captivity captive that's what's going to happen to you and me this week we're going to lead captivity captive And the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I? The Lord is the strength of my life. Whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even mine enemies and my foes, came upon me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell. Though an host should encamp against me, my heart will not fear. The war should rise against me, and this will I be confident. One thing have I desired of the Lord, and that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord forever to inquire of the Lord.
for in the time of trouble he shall hide me. In the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me. He shall set me up upon a rock. Upon a what? Who is that rock? Jesus. How shall mine head be lifted up above mine enemies round about me? Therefore will I offer in his tabernacle sacrifices of joy. I will sing praises. Yea, I will sing praises unto the Lord. In the midst of thee is mighty. He will say, He will rejoice over thee with joy. He will rest in his love. He'll restore the backsliders. He'll undo them that afflict us. It's God's intent for the end time. My prayer is thy kingdom come and thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. 